Why have you changed it to The Rock? <laughs> because he's big. He's bold. He kind of does resemble the engineer. He'll take, that, yeah. he'll take that starship, turn it sideways, and shove it up your candy ass. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Can it was because of the engineer's cooking. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> oh, dear. Hello, welcome back film fans and horror nerds maybe this week to a new episode of the Silver Screen Podcast. I am your regular host or one of your regular hosts, Mike. Uh, I am joined as always by our co-host, DK. Game over, man! <laughs> yeah, we are joined by a very special guest, a returning guest. Uh, we were um, going to have somebody else on, but unfortunately, uh, you know, life got in the way. And so for the second time in a row, yeah, I'm thinking she's back from our Sean Wick <laughs> review. Please welcome Sandra Evanson. Hello. <laughs> welcome back and thank you for stepping in kind of last minute sandra to uh probably defend prometheus it seems like but uh yeah awesome well, uh, finally like enough. Did bad. We, were, we were gonna have someone else on but they didn't bother so yeah we got sandy back and funnily enough <laughs> i'm even better prepared than usual so this will be fun i actually have a a whole ending written that's Ooh. awesome. I, I, we the reason that I invited you on because we were we would have probably just went ahead with the two hander, but I did the usual like asking for the audience and audience response. Sorry, uh, what were your thoughts on this movie? And audience, Sandra posted an essay on Prometheus <laughs> after she'd watched it just to our Discord. Like, the, here's your audience interaction section, and I was like, Sandra, I can't read this out. <laughs> this would take up half of the flipping runtime of the podcast. What are we going to do? And so um, she sent me a cut down version, which was hilarious. And I'm going to let you share it with the audience, Sandra. What were your, your one sentence thoughts? Oh, my goodness. I didn't have it in front of me, but it was something like movie bad, but movie mostly good. M caveman. <laughs> 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 yeah, I haven't actually announced what it is we're reviewing, but again, we, you know, we, our audience aren't stupid. You'll have seen the thumbnail, all of the promotion, and you can see it on the screen. We are reviewing the movie Prometheus, Ridley Scott's movie that is or is not a prequel to Alien. I'm sure we'll get into all of that a bit back and forth, but uh, yeah, Ridley Scott's movie that takes place possibly in the same universe as Alien and serves as a prequel. I'm being facetious, of course, because of Alien Covenant, it now is definitely a prequel to Alien, but at the time there was some debate. So, uh, Anyway, so yeah, before I get any further into all that, um, I usually throw the behind-the-scenes section to DK, and this week is no exception. So, DK, you fought through your distaste for this to develop some behind-the-scenes uh, <laughs> facts and figures on Prometheus to pass on to the audience, is that right? Yeah, spoilers, but yeah, cheers, Mike. Uh... <laughs> Nah, That's I'm okay. not saying the entire production on this was chaotic. Heaven knows that label could be applied to many, if not the majority of movies produced these days. But as I spoke to you earlier in the week, looking behind the scenes of this, it does make me wonder how it got made at all. There's just so much <laughs> on this. I mean, so much. It would take an entire episode to go through it all. But as it stands, yeah. here's what I, uh, I cobbled together. And trust me, it wasn't easy. I deserve hazard pay for this shit. <laughs> now, uh, James Cameron was originally in the running to direct what eventually became Prometheus, and after speaking with Scott, began to work with a writer on developing a script. But around the same time, he was asked if he'd be interested in directing what eventually would become Alien v Predator. Cameron declined, stating that such a movie would destroy any credibility the Xenomorphs had as a source of horror. So when Fox went ahead with uh, AVP, Cameron then declined the offer of the prequel also. Ooh. Now, Space's original script, developed with Scott, appeared to be much more of a prequel to the, uh, the Alien movies than Scott and then later Fox themselves wished for. And once the script was complete, in Scott's own words, Fox pushed for the project to be more of an original work, and Lindelof was brought on board by Scott to redevelop Spates' original script. Now, gradually, the production team began to subtly, although not subtly enough in my opinion, distance the project from the Alien franchise, with Scott stating, and this is the first of many, 
While Alien was indeed the jumping off point for this project, out of the creative process evolved a new grand mythology and universe in which this original <laughs> story takes place. Pretension. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the team plan will recognise strands of Alien's DNA, so to speak, but the ideas tackled in this film are unique, large, provocative and stupid. No, just unprovocative. <laughs> Scott then went on to say at a later date that while it takes place in the same universe as the original Alien and you'd be able to see some strands of where it would lead, it was entirely its own story. Bullshit! Now, Lindelof himself said that Prometheus would be a unique story running parallel to the original but not having anything to do with Alien and any sequel would be a Prometheus sequel and not an Alien sequel and we all know how that worked out. Yeah, that aged like milk, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. Now, the confusion over the script and ultimately the imagery within was addressed on several occasions during filming. And after the film's release, with Scott at times saying it has very little to do with Alien regarding the original creature, he then said the sequel squeezed him dry. He did very well and no way am I going back there. Going on record to state that the creature seen within the film, the Deacon, is in no way related to the Xenomorphs at all. <laughs> <laughs> While his later decisions, after some critical pushback, it must be said, seem to have leaned more into the Alien franchise with the eventual sequel, Alien Covenant. Now, many of the designers claim to have been subconsciously influenced by the original creature's designer, oh, H.R. Yeah. Giger. And yes, consciously. That's why he's credited in the credits. To yeah, and then Scott brought him on himself to work on the design. <laughs> As a result, many criticised the script and Scott himself for not knowing just what it was that he was making. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the underlying confusion seems to have permeated pretty much all aspects of production. Also in the sequence where a holographic Peter Wayland addresses the crew of Prometheus, you'll know this, Mike, the musical underscore heard quotes of Jerry Goldsmith's original theme to 1979's Alien. So, you know... Mm. If they're trying to distance themselves, they're not doing a great job. Well, yeah, yeah as, as I mentioned to you, the fact that they literally have the title Prometheus appear on screen in the exact same way that the title Alien appears on screen. Yeah. Within yeah. like literally like three minutes into the movie, it's like, all right, come on. <laughs> yeah. Now, this to and fro seems to have continued during actual filming. I'm going to talk about what you sent me now, Mike. The scene where Fifield turns up back at the ship, having been transformed by the alien goo into some sort of zombie-type monster, was written and originally shot differently. In the original script, tentatively titled Alien Engineers by screenwriter Spates, Fifield's transformation is quite different. His skull is elongated, he has abnormally long arms and talons and dorsal tubes tearing out of his suit, giving him the appearance of a proto-xenomorph. That's right. Spates envisioned the goo having the ability to turn anyone into a xenomorph. Now, Scott eventually nixed the idea, not wanting to tie the events of the movie too closely to the Alien franchise, because obviously, you know, it was a time for another personality to take over that day. But he uh, decided this pretty late in the day. The scene was actually shot and some post-production work had taken place on it before Scott ultimately decided to remove it and replace it with the scene that we got. Though it is included on the Blu-ray Blu release under Extra and Deleted Scenes. Yeah, and it's it looks really, like, fully finished. So yeah. it seems like it was either a last-minute decision or they just finished it for the deleted scene release because it's there, man. I mean, you can go watch yeah. it, and I recommend it. It's a pretty good-looking creature effect for a proto-xenomorph, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> Never one to let an idea go to waste. And I put this one in just for you, Mike, after our conversation oh, no. earlier in the week. In one of the drafts for the original Alien, there was a sex scene between Ripley and Dallas to show how crew members would engage in casual sex during long space travels. Ridley Scott never filmed the scene back then, but decided to use the idea in Prometheus in the exchange between Vickers and Janek. Uh, <laughs> now, speaking I of... I hate that scene. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, uh, Charlie Theron was originally cast to play Shaw, but had to pull out due to commitments on Mad Max Fury Road. However, a schedule opened up unexpectedly closer to the Prometheus start date. Unfortunately, by this point, the role had already been recast with uh, Numi Rapace, whom Fox was 
dead set against, but Scott liked in The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Scott desperately wanted Theron in the movie regardless and thus cast her as Vickers. And uh, for those interested, Rapace's original test was with Rafe Spall, who was originally due to be playing Holloway before then he was recast as Milburn. Yeah. I should clarify for the audience, by the way, that although I agree with a lot of what DK's assessments, I don't despise this movie in case you're like, oh, I like this movie. I'm not going to listen to the rest of this podcast. And Sandra really likes it. So we've no. got a range of opinions. We're not I just shitting on it. really likes it, but <laughs> <laughs> enough well likes it. Parts. <laughs> yeah. I, I like aspects of it. Don't get me wrong. Mm. Now, the credits are very good. Now, regarding the casting, Scott was determined from the outset to cast... Uh, Fastbender as the android, despite Fastbender's agents purportedly asking too much for his fee to appear, finally acquiring him after much negotiation. Now, an interesting little bit of trivia here. This continues the tradition of naming the androids Yay! alphabetically: Ash in Alien, yes. Bishop in Aliens, Call in Alien Resurrection, and now David. Yeah, which kind of gets screwed over by Covenant when they go with Walter. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they just thought, "Yeah, we're not going to get any more sequels there." It was no. It makes sense in its own way because it's a reference to David Geiler and Walter Hill, who are like feature uh, designers, okay. I think, or producers on the Alien. Now Scott originally stated that he was filming the most, and I'm using quotes here, the most aggressive film he could, by not caring about MPAA ratings. But then he shot the film with both adult-only R and more accessible PG-13 content, allowing the more adult imagery to be deleted if cuts were demanded. Now, the film was eventually rated R for sci-fi violence, including some intense images and brief language, and it was released without any demanded cuts. So, yes, it was intended as release, but again, what was stated and what eventually happened appear to have been two different things. Yeah. Now, as we know, despite Lindelof's statement during production, Prometheus did receive a sequel, and it was indeed under the Alien title. Alien Covenant was released in 2017, and although it received generally positive reviews on the whole, it was criticised for many of the same problems as this one. You know, i.e. stupid people. Now, I'm not going to go into it, as that's an episode for another time. Uh, originally, Prometheus and Covenant were to be parts one and two, respectively, in a prequel trilogy. Mm. However, prior to Covenant's release, Scott stated that he was planning a further two sequels to Covenant that would take the saga right up to the 1979 original Alien. Adding, who knows, maybe even a fourth film. That would make Covenant a trilogy and Prometheus a prequel to those. In March of 2017... James Cameron. <laughs> in March of 2017, Scott then stated, if you really want a franchise, I can keep crank cranking it out for another six. I'm not going to close it down again. No way. As of today, there have been no further sequels with the Alien Saga now taking the form of an upcoming Disney Plus series. While Scott... He's now producing the sequel to Gladiator. Back to you. <laughs> I mean, so, it would have kind this... of been really cool to have a Rogue Zero One moment where, you know, it yeah. does lead right up to 1979. And maybe the series has plans to do that. That would be really cool. I kind of, I remember Ridley Scott saying that and I really resent that he did because it seems like Covenant would have been a perfect point to do that. And he's kind of, he backtracks his way out of linking them up to try and kind of squeeze out these other sequels. So now you just end up with this horribly disjointed two prequels to Alien that don't connect. I, <laughs> with like I, a I, you know, bit in between. <laughs> I've got to say, I had a lot of respect for Ridley Scott. I've not seen all his movies, but I had a lot of respect for him before this mess. And I, I, the fact that he's yeah. now going back to Gladiator and appears to be, you know, going back to his previous successes in order to try and crank something new out, it's it doesn't it doesn't exactly suggest a director with confidence. I haven't got anything to add to the behind the scenes stuff, but I do happen to have opened the um, Zenopedia, which has all of the random names and how these things all connect and stuff to the movie. So if you hear me refer to something by its proper name, it's because I have it right in front of me. <laughs> I was, um, but yeah. Just as an aside, I do like, uh, we were talking about this earlier in the week and Mike suggested that I look up the life cycle of yes. the alien creature now that Prometheus and Covenant have been included. And I can just imagine some poor fanboy sat at a desk <laughs> and audit this wiki just thinking, uh, there's just not enough coffee in the world for this shit. 
<laughs> it is hilarious. You have never seen a flow chart that look more complicated. And even parts of the movies like contradict each other and stuff. Cause I'm sure I, I, I've got it in my notes somewhere, but I may as well bring it up now that in this movie in Prometheus, they see a mural, which contains images of the classic Xenomorph, uh, which we would know as being like, you know, a, an alien face hugger that impregnated a human that then gave birth to a Xenomorph. But then according to Covenant, that shouldn't exist. It yeah. doesn't make any I've, sense. I've got that written down. I've got it written yeah. down. He's, he's, you know, Scott's there saying, these have got nothing to do with Alien. The aliens, the Xenomorphs in Alien are so far off, it's unreal. And you think, you've got them on the fucking wall. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which again, it's so weird because that confuses everything. Like that was the whole point of them saying that now, well, one of many points of saying that now the Alien versus Predator movies aren't canon and we're disregarding them because they can't be. Because obviously, you know, we would have had Xenomorphs and Predators hundreds of thousands of years ago doing ritual hunts or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's just weird. I, I, I didn't need to know where the Xenomorphs came from. And uh, the, the, the one thing I will add before we jump into the review, though, is the name for what should be something so simple, the black goo, which apparently now everything stems from, is perfect for how convoluted and stupid the general ideas of this franchise became. Do you want to know what the name of it officially is in the franchise? Go for it. It is chemical AO-395X.91-15. <laughs> Oh. They didn't name it Unobtainium. <laughs> <laughs> I think Unobtainium would have been better at this point than what, like this weird thing. You look through the wiki and every reference to it is like that full thing highlighted, and I'm like, it's just black goo. Just call it the black goo. I don't <laughs> like the fact that yeah, and I don't like the fact that they've come in and just said, you know, Alien v Predator is now not canon mm. because yeah. The they weren't the best made movies, and the second one were absolute dogs. Yes, agreed. Yeah, but the third, the first one, it's fairly enjoyable. Right. I can watch it, yeah. but then it's it's that kind of condescension to say, no, this film now isn't canon. This one that I'm making now, this is the legitimate way to go, and then just drop the ball so spectacularly on it. It just. Yeah. Uh, well, as I said, the weird thing is that there are things that desperately try to unify this all into one thing, and it's both hilarious and fascinating, so I do recommend if you do get a chance to have a deep dive one night when you're bored and search the internet. Like I said, the, the, the fact that there's alien xenomorphs on this mural in Prometheus already proved that Covenant's idea that they were created by David, which was apparently Ridley Scott's overall decision, can't be true. So, you know... <laughs> Uh, I think initially the idea was maybe it was going to be some kind of multiverse or different timelines, and now it's just like ah, there were separate groups of xenomorphs. David was copying an engineer idea that they'd already had, so that explains where they came from. And I'm like, I, I admire the, the sheer tenacity of whichever person is in charge of the continuity of this franchise. That's like, how in the world are we going to make this all connect and make sense? The, the only thing I can think of, which we'll, we'll, we'll get to an you know, eventually. But, I mean, as we were saying earlier, either Scott was undermined by pretty much everyone involved in this production, or he didn't know what he wanted, or he's literally the world's worst communicator, which for a director is a big problem. I think it was a little bit of everything, because as you said, John Spates' script was basically an alien prequel, and that had the sort of... Like, his ideas were admittedly still not great, but it was less convoluted than it became, which was just... We're going to find the black goo. The black goo will have the ability to basically, you know, map xenomorph DNA onto any life form and transform them into a xenomorph, which isn't that far from the deleted scene in the first Alien, where Ridley Scott has one of the captured people transforming into a xenomorph, or into a xenomorph egg, I should say, um, because it's it was Gallus, before. In the deleted scene, she stumbles Gallus, up on yeah. Gallus and he's transforming into an egg. I'm so glad yeah. that will come. It's, it's in the director's gut, inexplicably. Oh, my God, have <laughs> they put it back in? I'm pretty sure it, I could be wrong. Don't don't uh, quote me on that. But I'm fairly <laughs> sure. I'm fairly sure it was in Ridley Scott's director's cut of the first Alien. But yeah, with the introduction of the Alien Queen and aliens, it makes no sense at all whatsoever. But 
Yeah, never mind. Like I said, the continuity of this franchise has just gone full Red Dwarf slash Fox X Men at this point. So, <laughs> from, what, from what I can understand, Sandy, run about. I hope it continues. The synopsis for the Disney Plus series doesn't sound great. It's about a bunch of kids. Huh. From what it says, a bunch it of like young really people. Disney Plus, huh? Yeah, I'm really hoping not. I'm hoping they give us something worthwhile, like Prey. But yeah, that it would doesn't be sound great from that synopsis. Yeah. Oh dear. So they're doing, you know, <laughs> Ellen Ripley Jr. <laughs> basically. As long as it's not Willow quality, it should be okay. Yeah. We've chatted enough, so then, uh, as I said, if you're new here, I say this all the time, but just in case we have any new listeners jumping on, we go into a review of the film, which breaks down into uh, sections rather than going beat by beat to the story. So acting, directing, sound, uh, VFX, let's see, what else? <laughs> just various different bits you'll see as we kind of come along, um, you know, anything else. And then we finish up with our favourite character moment and line in the movie and then give our conclusion and a score out of five stars as you would see on Letterboxd or any of those places that reviews movies. Uh, and then obviously I do have an audience response section as well, taken from Discord, Letterboxd, and nowhere else, because nobody bothered responding, <laughs> unsurprisingly, this week. So, yeah, anyway, uh, we'll start with the acting then, and I'm going to throw it over to uh, to you guys. I'll start with you, Sandra. Do you have any particular notes on the acting in this movie? I just thought some scenes that uh, Numi Rapace did were really, really well acted. I didn't have a problem with anybody's acting, really. I thought everybody was pretty believable. I thought the characters were unique. And with the exception of the biologists, I think everybody else was pretty charismatic. Uh, so, yeah, I thought. And then, of course, I mean, we've got some great people. Um, Numi's already proved herself many times over as an actress. So uh, I don't think, I mean, how could we expect anything less from from these this cast of characters? Idris Elba, especially. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm always surprised every time I watch this movie that a very young Benedict Wong appears in it. What I was going to ask you, Sandra, was what you thought about Numi Rapace's accent in the movie. I forgot. Yeah, I it, no, no issue with it at all. Totally forgot okay. that she wasn't a, a American speaker. A well, speaker of American. <laughs> it's it's supposed to be English, so that's already a minus, but okay. Um, the reason that I bring it up is that maybe it's because I am English, but it's like I remember reading when I was doing a little bit of research for this that they said Numi Rapace really wanted to have the role and they wanted her to have it. So she studied really hard and developed what they call a flawless English accent. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, I'm sorry, but what? <laughs> like at times she's close maybe, but... Yeah, yeah, and then other times she just loses it completely. Yeah, it goes full Swedish quite a lot. But maybe, again, I'm wondering if, because we're English, we pick up on it as, like, we don't sound like that. <laughs> well, that's, that's Look, I mean, the one note I have for acting, there is, there is two things, but the one note that I actually have for acting is, oh, those accents. Now, one of them is repressive. I don't mind them. But, no, it's all right, but it, it's, it's not English, regardless. Yeah, like, talking to... to to DK's point about like direction and stuff, it's confusing to me that they have some actors that they let use their natural accent. So the guy who plays Fifield or Kate Dickey's in this using her exact accent or Mad Lissa Aaron from Game of Thrones, if you prefer. Um, and it's just odd <laughs> that I'm like, oh, and even Benedict Wong is allowed to use his natural accent in this, um, you know, probably more so than his early Marvel appearances even. And I'm just thinking, why did they just, why didn't they just let everyone use their accent? It's supposed to be presumably a fairly multicultural crew yeah so yeah it just seemed odd yeah. the only other note i've got for acting is and it, in fairness to him a lot of it is down to the prosthetics but i've just guy pierce he's not good at playing an old person yeah that's i i don't i don't put that on him i, I blame the prosthetics for a lot i don't know some of his mannerisms it, it it did seem very almost russ abbott in the way he was playing he, an old way. Yeah, but if you've been sitting for five hours having sixty pounds of latex applied to you, I would imagine you probably you know you don't know what you're doing at that stage. So yeah, it's just an odd choice. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, I will say some some of that is nitpicking the accent talk. It was just something I noted, and especially in the case of Numi Rapass, I think she's the best thing in the movie. She's fantastic. And I thought she was great. I thought everyone was great, like like you guys in the movie, all of the performances. 
Um, I, I'm a little on the fence with regards to Michael Fassbender, but I don't think it's his performance. I think it's what he's given, like the writing and the dialogue, yeah. um, because he is basically pretension machine <laughs> for a lot of the movie. <laughs> he's, a, he's a great actor, and I think he's very good in the role, and I loved his impersonation of uh, Peter O'Toole. But, mm, yeah. Uh, it, yeah, as you say, the, the, the material he was given, it, it just... It let everybody down, basically. So, yeah, um, this doesn't really need to do with the acting again so much as the writing. But I'm sure we'll get into it more as we talk about plot and stuff. But the sheer idiocy of everyone supposedly being a scientist and then like taking off their helmets or playing with oh, hammerpeds oh. or <laughs> the it, dumb thing. <laughs> I've, uh, yeah, I've got nothing to say now with regards to acting, and pretty much everything now is just how much i despise this script yeah uh, i will i'll finish my notes on acting then because i don't have a lot but um i will say that i liked the scene uh, i think it shows off both of their performances when fifield is very angry and getting like right up into shaw's face um when they kind of first i, I forget what it is but it's something about you know well oh, i'm just a geologist and i didn't come out here for this and whatever else so we, but he's right in there and he portrays that anger really well throughout the movie and she is so great at being stoic um and not being bothered by this and she's a much better portrayal of a female stoic character than vickers which baffles me that they're both in the same movie because they're literally chalk and cheese and a perfect example of how to write a good woman character and how to write a terrible woman character at the same time yeah but again I'll well talk i about think that later. was supposed to be the Ripley. I mean obviously oh, I mean, supposed yeah. to be the Ripley. I do, I do like that it. and yeah but yeah. <laughs> I do like that that moment where Fifield is getting in her face and shouting at her and, and she just says thank you. And yes that's what I mean yeah that the yeah, he's just unbothered by it. Yeah I love it and I love that um I I think she portrays the kind of idea of, of love and faith and some of these broader concepts really well. And I like that the movie has that, which again, I'll touch on more in the writing, but I think that um, Noomi sort of, she, she's very good at conveying that without ever seeming hokey or, you know, uh, without ever seeming to contradict her, her performance with the dialogue or anything. I think um, she's good enough to the fact that when some of the material that she's given, and by far, in my opinion, she does have the best material, the best lines in the movie to a certain yeah. extent. But even when she's given lines that aren't that great and things that, they're just awful, awful in, in, in other films. I mean, you know, generally, if anybody else had delivered in this movie, it would just be rank alongside the rest of it. But she does a good job of uh, conveying it, and it yeah. doesn't sound as hokey as it could have. Yeah. I do think there's other good things as well, though. I, I should probably shout out. Um, I really forgot to get the other actor's name, and I should have, but Benedict Wong and the other pilot. I love that they have this ongoing thing, like the bet of whether or not it's a terraforming. Yeah. Um, that sort of extends just in the background, just but it just feels so natural and so it adds so much to the lived-in nature of characters when everybody else is being pretentious that I really appreciated that that was there. Um, I like the crew. Again, Benedict Wong, that guy that you're talking about, you know, forgive me, I, I don't know his name, and Idris Elba. Yeah. I think they're yeah. all really likable characters and they have this, you know, it comes across that they have a background together and I like that. That's a, a very good touch. Yeah. I think they're a lot closer to the space truckers of the first alien, not to, you know, keep on linking it, but it is linked. Um, but yeah, I think they're a lot closer than than any of the other characters, the, the Vickers, the Shaw, Holloway, you know, uh, of the the movie, which are, you know, not all that relatable, shall we say, at times. Um, I mean, even though she's not the real Liz Shaw, we know who the real Liz Shaw is, and she wouldn't have put up with any of this crap. The real Liz Shaw is the late, great Caroline John, who started exactly. on Berkeley in a single season of Doctor Who, of course. <laughs> oh. Eamon or Emoon Elliot uh, ah, yes, of plays course. Chance and Benedict yes. Wong's name is Ravel. Ravel. I knew Ravel, but yeah. I, I didn't know. I, I, I knew Chance the character, but I didn't know Eamon Elliot. So, yeah, that uh, that explains that. Also, what was I going to Oh, um, you didn't mention it in the behind the scenes section, so I'm not sure if you kind of came across this in your uh, you know studying of the bits and pieces. But uh, apparently, Charlie's Theron was told specifically to play Vickers as stilted and robotic because they wanted it to be actually debatable for the audience whether or not she was synthetic like david um right down to being sort of the other child of, of guy ps's character of wayland 
So I was gonna bring that up. The whole um, yeah. scene that you said you hated between her and Idris in there, I thought that was the red herring, you know, being discussed and mm. you know how she reacted, then it just dismissed the red herring that they just put in there. So that was, you know, interesting. But that's what I thought that whole scene was about. I'll I'll get to it when we talk about the the scene later on, but I just I despise it. I think it's so offensive on so many levels. I just yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, what was I going to say? But yeah, so I I can't really blame. I, I would say that she's very stilted and and her performances, but then again, she was directed like that, so I can't blame her for that. And I will say that even on top of that, when she's kind of forced by him to to kill Holloway. Uh, I actually thought that was really tense and effective, and I genuinely did think that was the only time you saw, you know, actual emotion from that character until the very end. Obviously, when it's like you know, try to learn how to run left or right. <laughs> but, yeah. but what so, if you yeah, can't decide so. and you're just like frozen in the middle? <laughs> <laughs> She's already running forward. <laughs> She's literally seen the person with a drop and roll out of the way. It's not complicated, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I've already mentioned, I think I, I like Fifield's kind of when he's portraying the rage and the fear, but I just think Milburn and Fifield, again, I don't necessarily blame the actors, but I just, they're so the Tweedledum and Tweedledummer of this movie. They're so stupid. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, for supposedly being scientists who are worried about things, everything they do just seems like, why would you write a character so incomprehensibly dumb? <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> it's so uh, yeah. pitiful. <laughs> So that's all I had on the acting. Any other notes before we move on? Mm -mm. No. Okay. Um, so we're moving into the writing and the plot. DK, don't say it. You know you want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first thing that I wanted to note here is I find it hilarious and telling that on the Blu-ray that I have for Prometheus, there's a big sticker that says, questions will be answered, <laughs> which I've just noted. Well, that tells you a lot. Shouldn't the movie have answered them? <laughs> Jesus. No, you have to get the Blu-ray for the special features to answer these questions, apparently. <sighs> anyway. <laughs> but it answers um, them in a way that makes the answers unsatisfying. And the new questions yeah. that it asks, in some respects, are just not worth bothering with. Oh, it's pure marketing spin. Don't get me wrong. There's still, there's still no answers, really. You know, but, uh, yeah. There's um, one answer. Oh, what's that? Why he ripped David's head off. <laughs> oh yeah 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 i mean yeah but we kind of knew that from the movie though i'm talking about like yeah the bigger questions shall we say that it just leaves completely unanswered not necessarily just about how it connects to the franchise at large which they didn't seem to like i said they, they didn't want it to then they did and whatever else but i'm talking about like to me it's never made all that clear although they seem to just accept it the idea of like the engineers seeding life and that being what happened all those years ago and yeah, a lot of it's just like, really? Why? What? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the, you find out who the legendary space jockeys are from the original movie. They're now just a spacesuit for a race of albino Uber Arnold Vosslers. <laughs> yeah, which is another thing that bugs me because, DK, you know that we as Star Trek fans both love and hate the idea of visual canon, but it kind of just shits on even the original alien because the space jockey that was fused into that ship is like huge like humongous dwarfs yeah. the humans gotta be 25 feet tall at minimum and yet the engineers are maybe nine or ten feet not yeah. that much bigger so even that doesn't make any sense no uh but yeah, i i, I anyway. just i can't oh, i just can't excuse any of this yeah i, I see where you're coming from and i, I to an extent i do agree but yeah um but yeah, so did you guys have any thoughts before I start getting into my breakdowns of, of the writing and the plot sort of overall? I've got yeah. so many notes on my <laughs> so many well notes. you can you can jump in on my <laughs> if you don't mind <laughs> because I kind of have it breaking down by like I said, it's kind of chronological, but it, some things will be in direction when we get to it rather than writing. Okay. So, be prepared um, for a lot of interruptions then, do. And I Absolutely. guess I'll, I'm That's just like method. very good at theorizing and reading between mm. lines that, like we mentioned before, might not be there, but I'm just very yeah. good at filling oh, no, in I'm, gaps. I'm here for that. And I appreciate sometimes a lot of the sort of big questions that the film does ask or a lot of the thematic things that it's touching on. I really do appreciate. And I kind of like that they are there. Um, but yeah, I would have appreciated perhaps more exploration and more 
attempt at resolution. As I say, we'll get to it. But um, again, another thing that you didn't pick up on in the behind the scenes section, DK, which might be for the best because it's very offensive, is the idea that something happened exactly 2,000 years ago. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, do you want me yeah. to go into it or would you rather go into it? Well, let's go into it later. Okay. Because I'll leave that. Holy well, shit. Yeah. <laughs> we, we'll touch on it later, but yeah, very, uh, very iffy. So, with regards to kind of related to that, then the idea of this chemical long numbers and letters name supposedly has the ability, if an engineer ingests it fully, to break them down and turn them into the DNA that forms the building blocks of it. What's that about? What? Why is that? <laughs> I mean, I didn't know what? that the black goo was the thing that he drank it at. Well, at the beginning. There's some debate as to whether or not it is. That's the thing. Like the, like I said, the people that try to unify it as one cohesive thing that tries to make sense say, "Oh, it must be," and it's just that it has different effects on different people. So that Fifield becomes what they call an anathema which is like a phase two <clears throat> or three of infection because he got sprayed full on in the face. Holloway was just a phase one because it was just a little drop in his drink, which is why he kind of has the black veins appearing and his skin becoming a bit looser. Um, and, you know, if you fully ingest it, you become an immediate phase four, which is just complete bodily breakdown and, it, you know, you, you just, become it, the DNA level. I don't know. I'm going to start. Well, you know, when in the very beginning, when he uh, drops into the waterfall, and at first, you know, you see the DNA like die and then it start and and deteriorate and then it kind of starts to reform and come back to life. But you also see like a black cloud come off of it, which looks like maybe bad CGI of the body decomposing. But, you know, later when you see Covenant, in my opinion, it's nanotech. And it looks exactly like a nanotech cloud. And then we see, you know, uh, later on in the cave when he's uh, looking at that, uh, David's looking at the green goo and he's stretched apart his fingers and there's these little green glistening moving around things, which then become like some sort of memory server that show what happened in there. And it, to me, it just looks like nanotech. Mm. I think you, you're reading a lot in and you've added something which a lot of the people behind these wikis don't see, but they do kind of agree with you that the engineers have the biological equivalent of what we would call technology, which is why they're, like you see David put his hand in that gooey bulbous thing as, as controls. So there's a lot of like, they actually use genetics as we would use tech and they use things that we would call artistic, like music, which is why you see the engineer like play a flute yeah. to use as controls and stuff. Which, again, but, are really cool ideas that they never really get all that well into, really. But obviously, you know, obviously they're seeding for life on the planet. Yeah. And somebody volunteers and they break themselves down. But in that case, if it's the black goo that they're drinking that's breaking them down, wouldn't that make Homo sapiens part xenomorph in some weird kind of aspect which yeah but that's kind of the point because that is like we we are already like it, the alien franchise already had it that it was a symbiotic relationship and the xenomorphs take on aspects of whatever they you know oh yeah the, i mean there's, yeah. <laughs> but, but so there's always been that link you know but yeah but so yeah i mean it, a, yeah genetically i would say yes genetically it would have to be true because we're made from the same building blocks but i was thinking it then follows out Earth's regular, as well-known evolutionary cycle. First, it made denizens of the deep who eventually one day crawled out of the depths, became dinosaurs, you know, as just figured Earth then followed its typical evolutionary process. That what this was, was panspermia, basically. The building blocks of life came to us from the stars and, mm. and you know, started that way the only thing we're missing is the lightning right because the first action um was the engineers and then just to go back to what you were talking about the there's some debate online about if that sacrifice actually knew what he was there for because the spaceship dipped right away like as soon as he started drinking that goo and either it hurt really bad or he was surprised. I mean, at first he looked very much at peace. I guess I'm very happy to, I don't know if he thought he was going to urinate it out or uh, <laughs> what, but he he definitely looked, there was some shock. He, maybe he didn't think it was going to hurt that bad or he didn't expect to be melted. Yeah. From what, yeah. from what I've read, he, you know, 
they were willing to do it, but he just probably didn't yeah. expect it to sting that much. From the uh, from the wiki, apparently the scene is uh, of the engineer being sacrificed is a reference to the myth of Geshtu E, also called Geshtu or Gestu, a minor god of intelligence from ancient Sumerian and Akkadian mythology. And according to that legend, he was sacrificed by the greater gods so his blood could be used in the creation of mankind. So yeah, somebody had just read far too many textbooks, basically. Yeah. Um, but the also... Sumerians have our first written records, our first origin. Uh, you know, that we do have uh, in written records, um, origin yeah. story. That's interesting. Yeah. I will say um, in terms of whether you're wondering whether it is like a, a willing sacrifice or not. Again, there is deleted scenes of what looks like a, an elder of the engineer race, like full on cloaked, uh, like walking the guy as if like, you know, oh, giving last rites like a priest would, yeah. which seems to imply yeah. that it was a voluntary sacrifice. Um but yeah, I just I hate all of this because I just don't like this idea of humanity being created by this other race, and I didn't need it, and it has nothing to do with the Alien franchise, and it doesn't go anywhere. So I'm already not on board with it, and uh, um, do you guys feel similarly? Or I'm um, I'm still wrestling with the idea of the black goo. Uh I'm just it just seems to be this all-purpose kind of. I'm going to start and call it a Mary goo. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, as I said. <laughs> It's a biological thing is water, that... and it can change you. It can change you by, by you know having your face shoved in it. You can drink it. You know it can turn you into a protozoanomorph. It can give rise to penis cobras. Well, it's just we don't we don't we don't know that it can turn you into a protozoanomorph because they cut that scene. And again, we don't know that the thing that the guy's drinking is necessarily the same pathogen, which there's been a lot of disagreement about. So if you remove those things, the idea of it being a biological weapon kind of makes sense, and it does. Like I said. The fact that they've broken it down into okay, it's a it's a pathogen that has these exact four stages of effects, which you see at different times in the movie. I appreciate that somebody did that, and it's like okay, I get it now. It makes sense. Um, it it's the only reason that you can get like the the scene later on of the worm thing that then becomes a hammerpede because but, it's obviously being mutated by that. Oh know? yeah, but but you you know as you were saying about Sandy that you think you know she might have been reading too much into that you do sometimes wonder how much the people writing these wikis are oh, doing that to try and explain yeah. away the you know discrepancy oh yes yeah. there's there's nothing in the movie to indicate that i don't think that was the intention of the script writers or director at all i think it was just like we're going to do this and it will have various random effects but like I said, I appreciate that somebody's like, okay, let's make it make sense a little bit. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. It doesn't it doesn't fully hold together because nobody wanted it to because they didn't like a lot of the questions in the movie. It's just like, eh, who cares? Stuff just happens. They on purpose <laughs> removed exposition just to yes. leave things out to the interpretation of the person, which is what art is supposed to do. And then it's also just freaking fun. It's fun for me. I like it. Uh, I had I, I had I had written down actually um black goo behaves randomly, and this is my own, you know, theorizing. Uh black goo behaves randomly on purpose to create diversity. Um, you know, so that it's not just always spitting out the exact same life form every single time. And well, it would depend um, on the life form it had infected anyway. That's the right. point. <laughs> and it's equal parts life and death and destruction just to maintain balance. You know, sometimes it could be something that kills and is harmful, and sometimes it could be you know, something else. I think you're yeah. giving Scott Lindelof and Spates way too much credit here. I might be, but or I agree, the yeah. theorizing might be part of the whole purpose, the the fun of the thing to create the fandom, the mythology, to give us something to debate and and, well, and give got, them I've, ideas for their later movies because i no do wonder sometimes no how much they there. pull from forums <laughs> yeah you can't be a doctor who fan and not fall into that trap i i don't know i, I don't want to, i don't want you to interpret this as an attack on you but i never i never like that idea of oh all art should be completely ambiguous and not give you an answer because i hate that and i really like you dk we've mentioned this before i really hate the people that when you say you don't like this film just go oh you're not smart enough to get it yeah it's like, no Shut up. Yeah, I, get it. I just don't like it. You know? I, I might, I might an... say differently, this is why I liked it. This is what yeah. I got yeah. from it. Yeah. I recently read an essay while I was doing all this behind the scenes stuff. Uh and it was basically on how everybody got Prometheus wrong. It's because we were waiting for the xenomorphs, we didn't see the layers behind it, and we're all idiots, basically. Now, yeah, yes, 
Scott may have become more of a misanthrope, and yes, the crew, with the possible exception of Shaw, are all deeply entrenched in their own arrogance, which is what this essay was, you know, referring to in, in the, the the entire crew is kind of, you know, the Prometheus of the of the title. But if that's the case, just why make everyone so damn stupid? It's it it's you, you cannot treat the audience as idiots when the characters in the film are blatantly, blatantly stupid. Yeah. Annoyingly yeah. so. Yeah. 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 And that's yeah. the problem with this. Is. It's the problem I have this, with this. It's it's like, yeah, it's fine. It asks the big questions. But as I said to Mike before the recording, it fails at its most basic premise. You don't have someone like Wayland, and the, he does refer to it that, you know, uh, well, Vickers does, that they spent a trillion on this mission. You don't spend that much money to essentially extend your own life and then staff the thing with clones of Paulie Shaw. Because after <laughs> that... <laughs> After that, the big questions just become moot. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, why why hire a geologist anyway? If you're looking for, you're not looking for that. You're looking for the idea of like something that seeded life based on this idea of, you know, we're being pointed somewhere. So why would you bring a geologist with you? It's what not possible that. function it's, it's does not, he have? <laughs> it's not an invitation. It's a trap. Okay, well, why, they, why well, set up the trap in the first place? Well, no, because the point is that it was, as we've touched on, but you didn't get into, that it was initially an invitation. And then, as I said, something happened 2,000 years ago that the engineers changed their minds and decided to wipe out humanity. But that was kind of an invitation from before that time, because they do mention it's like way, way thousands and thousands of years old. So. But did you have a geologist on board? Because it is, it's a scientific vessel. And and it said that in the film, this is scientific scientific vessel, seventeen crew. Uh, maybe they just always have a ge geologist anytime they're going to a a new planet because they're trying to figure out composition, what happened on the planet. But also, when they fly in, the very first question they ask is of the geologist, "Do you think that's natural?" So he came in handy. Mm, I well, guess apart from when it came to reading a map. Yeah, <laughs> he told him it was hollow, so that's where the first place they went. <laughs> I thought it was just weird that they're inside the cave. They just zero in on the on the uh, underground structure. They're just there. They don't set up camp. There's no oh look at this, look at that. They just beeline straight for that structure. It's it's like every single decision that this group of people made is the worst decision that they could have made. Yeah. Which the well, very next one, they take off their helmet. I, uh, yeah. So stupid. It told him the air was breathable, and then he had to test it out, I guess. And then didn't even, like, check for pathogens or anything else. Ugh. Yeah. My yeah. But that, that relates to my point that characters don't even act consistently one scene to the next, because I appreciate that Milburn and Fifield are terrified. And one scene I really like is that when they say, oh, there's a, an image, but it might be a glitch, but it's coming from the That's east of you. So and they say, funny. well, then we're going west. We're not dumb enough. Yeah. But then when they see the hammer peed, they're both like, oh, look at this cute thing. Let's kneel down. Let's get hugging. Yeah. Let's see. But it's clearly not something to mess with. Just leave it alone. You no, but you've, you've got five field going. These are my pups. He's obviously used them before. He's obviously got, you know, tremendous experience with using these things. They're making a map of the structure. The first thing they fucking do is get lost. <laughs> so they get lost, that. and then the biologist... Neil, as you say, kneels down, shoves his face in the in the penis cobra. Yeah, and he just and teases exactly. it. <laughs> Thinks it's hilarious. It's called a hammer peed, but I prefer no. it. <laughs> anyway, um, what was I going to say? Yeah, and related to that, it's kind of again, it's annoying that like we know David's probably like we've seen Alien, we get the whole link to Ash and everything, even though, you know, maybe it's not related or whatever. Um, so we know he's sinister, but they don't have any reason to think that. And then there's the scene when Shaw um, basically says to him, don't open the door. We don't know what's happening. And he just goes, oops. And I'm like, <laughs> at that point, you immediately take David back to the ship. Tell him he's not allowed on the mission. You do not trust his programming. Shut the bloody door again. Yeah. <laughs> you know? what, what is? Who is ultimately? Is, I mean, is David responsible for himself? What is his motivation? Because with Ash... He's being, yeah. He's being with sat Ash, there by... He was working for the company. And the company had given him orders to do this. 
I think that was that was me. Across like a complete dick. No, that was made explicit in the movie. I, it, whether you've kind of picked up on it or not, it was blatantly that Wayland was telling him what to do because you even have the scene of him whispering to Wayland in the like VR helmet thing, and Shaw specifically saying, "Once Wayland's dead, what will you do for programming?" And he says, "Oh, well, then I guess I'll be free." Um, That's fair so, enough. Yeah, I get that side of things, but then yeah. he is acting like a dick for a lot of the time. Oh yeah, and I mean, which, when you get to Covenant, it's it no sense at all. <laughs> You know, yeah. and, and the things he does, you know, he's just pressing random buttons. He says he can't understand this language, but he's, he's you know, yes, he's been studying it. But he's pressing random buttons, gets everything right. I mean, later on, it sure is handy that the engineers left him a tutorial level. He's <laughs> well, <geez. laughs> well, just, the no, I, I, he's pressed that behold. first to open that door had goo on them. So it's kind of like a safe cracker using f uh, fingerprints to figure out a pin code, you know, kind of like that. And I, d I don't have an issue like that as much as you do with like the way that he's acting like a dick, because I interpreted it as he's being pushed that way by Wayland, Wayland himself. Like the, the yeah. Company because you even have that scene where um, Vickers asks him, what did he say to you? And he says, he just said, try harder. Try harder. And it's then yeah. that he decides that he's going to infect Holloway after he's already been told try harder from Wayland, and then Holloway himself says, I'd go, I'd do anything and everything to get these answers. So I don't think it's him being a dick so much as him interpreting input from other people who are, you know, dumb, basically, oh, or yeah. dick themselves. <laughs> but, I mean, again, that takes me back to the dumb thing. She tells David not to touch one of those things, mm. and he brings one back. And yeah, fine, he brings one back. But no one notices that thing. Yeah, I mean, it's like don't shit, say, <laughs> that sure is a huge can of coke you've left there in the fridge. <laughs> well, I think they kind of knew because they do bring back the decapitated engineer's head as well, which again, maybe it's because we're post COVID now. But if you're going to wear a mask, then wear it. Don't have it hanging on your chin when you're you know, cutting into this alien head that you haven't got a clue what it does. <laughs> oh, that scene bugs the crap out of me. Now. I don't like the 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 trap that they usually falls into is stuff like this, the prequel tech. Whereas, mm. you know, mm -hmm. like, well, that was my, that was my next point I was going to make is that um, I've got written in my notes that I was going to sort of bring it up as a thing to discuss. Is this way too advanced? Because it says that the, they've discovered the actual cave paintings that lead them there maybe five years before the, the main events of the movie. But Prometheus's launch is in 2093. And I'm like, that's not that far from where we are now. That's, what, 60, 70 years from now? Yeah. 70 years from where we are now? In 70 years, we're going to have developed entirely human-looking synthetic life, space travel, holographic, you know, interface what? technology. It seems like a weird time to set it. And again, it's I just purely so it. it can fit the franchise. I think in some of the external material, what they did to promote, it's set in uh, Scott's timeline, whereas Blade Runner were in 2019, because at one point, yeah. they, he is talking about uh, Tyrell's androids in yeah. the promotion. Oh, no, I've, I've, seen, I've seen people that say, you know, Blade Runner's linked and is the part of the same universe, but again, that kind of belies the idea of it's not connected to anything, it's its own story. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know. What got me is, um, I mean, it starts off, it starts off beautifully with uh, David roaming around the halls in the ship, uh, watching Lawrence of Arabia, dying his hair, playing basketball while he's on the bike. I love yeah, I already that. find that pretentious, personally. But I okay. don't mind that. But then Just it goes a, to... Watch, a caretaker to, watching, to the crew. Yeah, it yeah. goes to watching crew members' dreams. Very mm -hmm. invasive. Yeah, you well, couldn't have thought of any way, any better way to touch upon Shaw's backstory than that. Yeah. I appreciate what it did in terms of Shaw's backstory, which will, you know, come up in my, my next point that I'm going to make. But yeah, there's got to be a better way than I've been watching your dreams, which is, again, how? Like, how do we have this technology? This exactly. But it also it makes sense. him, it makes him creepily obsessed yeah. with being human. That and dyeing his yeah. hair to look more like his sister. Um, yeah, well, it's not to look like his sister; it's to look like Peter O'Toole. That's the entire point. He's true. trying to. He thinks he's. He thinks he is T. E. Lawrence. He wants to be him, and he even says, "Oh, it's it's from a movie I like." When he quotes it later, and uh, yeah, what was I going to say? I had so a, he's I had a point creepily oh. obsessed with life, and by extension, its origins. 
Yeah, but you also get that, again, a scene which I quite enjoy when they say, David, why are you wearing a suit? And he says, well, I was designed this way to make it more comfortable for you because you don't like interacting with things that don't look like you. And if I didn't wear a suit, it would defeat that point. So I was like, oh, okay, that's an interesting idea in there if you had made this movie just about artificial life or about, you know, make it a Blade Runner sequel that has nothing to do with Alien about the search for origins and the difference between humans and synthetics. And again, I love this concept it gets into of, well, why did you create me? We made you because we could. Imagine how yeah. disappointed you'd be if you heard that. That's yeah. fascinating. That's a fantastic uh, yeah. thing to explore. Further, there's a bit further of a counterpoint when um, he tells them, when he's referring to the rest of the crew, he says, you people. Like he sets himself apart for yeah. them. And then yeah. um, uh, uh, Holloway remarks he was made to be close enough to human. And he responds, not too close, I hope. So it also it kind of gives him an inferior, uh, a superiority um a, a air of superiority to, to humans yeah it's... yeah and again it's kind of hard to discuss this without discussing covenant but again it, it's baffling that we can kind of explain a lot of his actions in this movie as being the way he's programmed or the way he's responded but the fact that he then becomes a genocidal dr mengil and covenant for no yeah. conceivable reason whatsoever is just baffling <laughs> it's I think a lot of it is an, uh, an attempt to clean up some of the mess from this movie, but Scott being yeah. Scott has just made an even bigger mess in an attempt yeah. to clean that up. But, I mean, I know a lot of people have a negative view, but honestly, I'd take that one over this any day of the week. Oh, yeah, well, but definitely, definitely. He also I mean, sees yeah, the, the most superior people in the movie as being the people who create life. Like, Waylon created him. Who created Waylon? Who created the engineers? Well, now he's there creating life. And then, of course, by the end of Covenant, you know, sailing off with 2,000 incubators and a bunch of eggs. So. And I get that as well, that, you know, if he, if he does have a god complex, again, it's come from nowhere, but that's why he would destroy the engineers, is that I'm better than these perceived gods, I suppose. But yeah. again, it just seems to come out of nowhere because it seems like, why Why does he want to do that? I'm so confused. Exactly. Why, it's, is it's... it? Where's his motivation motivation coming from? And well, like when said, Waylon it, dies, he loses his purpose. He's free. Well, exactly. So how does he then get a completely different purpose to be like, I want to create life? And why? Because well, he's he obsessed gonna... with it. He's experimenting, I think, just like he experimented by letting no, I... what's his nuts drink the black goo. He didn't know what was gonna happen. I don't I don't doubt he's experimenting. Like I said, he's clearly like, you know, some kind of Nazi scientist type, you know, he's horribly dissected show. He's experimenting with the various things that goo can do. He's created by covenant neomorphs and preto xenomorphs and whatever. But again, why? It doesn't yeah. explain it. It's just because that's what we need him to do in this movie. And this is the problem I've got with the script. <laughs> I mean, going back to what you said about it asked the big questions. And, you know, if they'd have concentrated on that, that's fine. I would have been perfectly happy with this movie had they not made any reference or any attempt to tie it to anything else. It yeah. didn't need to be an alien movie. It, yeah, you're right. And, and my favorite parts are the the big questions, yeah. the philosophical yeah. questions. And it, I mean, it's I mean, yeah. it's fine to have a. I mean, I said this to you, Mike. It's fine to have a script that looks at, you know, the creation of life, spirituality, faith, allusions to Greek mythology, place in the universe, all that. But make sure you've got a decent script and not something that looks like it's come from a, a Peter Rogers production. It's definitely got Cloverfield yeah. energy, which you well, know, yeah, Linda Lindelof's that's... been guilty of before. <laughs> that's what yeah. I was just going to say. I adore Lindelof for the Americans and for Watchmen. But at the same time, this is the guy who wrote Lost and Star Trek Into Darkness. So, you know, Back up on Lost now. Back up. Yeah, back up. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to take... Uh... I'm sorry, but what is Mystery Box the series? It really is. Whether you like it or not, it is just basically let's set up a mystery and worry later about how oh, we explain. Oh, I disagree. It's all about the characters. Yeah, mm. I'm, I'm with Sandy on that one. Well, you would agree to disagree, but yeah, I, I do think the... A lot of stuff in the stuff that I saw from the first season of Lost didn't have a satisfactory explanation because it was quite clear they didn't know basically that, what they were That doing. might be fair enough. And I can and I can pin that with regards to, you know, uh Lindelof and to an extent Abrams because it was his baby. Yeah. Oh, likewise. Bad, but likewise with this, I uh, you know, yeah, Spates came up with something, Lindelof came up with something, but at the end of the day, I blame Scott. It's like it's like two different films in one. I mean, you're watching it and you think, 
why is this happening? Why is this happening? This shouldn't be happening. This would be better if it wasn't in this movie. It is like watching Schrodinger's movie. It's like two different films in one, and it doesn't know what it wants to be. And I could have just completely done without any kind of alien stuff. It's a nonsense to say that it's not meant to be linked to Alien anyway, because at the end of the day, you don't create sets like the big engineer ship and the space jockey and link it like that if you're not planning to link it to that same universe. So the idea that it was not meant to be was always nonsense. I think it was more that, like you kind of touched on earlier, the audience goes in with a certain expectation of an alien movie that they weren't going to get from this. So by saying what they kind of were trying to, which is it's in the same universe as the alien movies, but you know, you're not going to get the Xenomorph. You won't get a straight out horror movie. This is more of a, a ponderous sci-fi, which fair enough links to the alien movies in a way makes it kind of a prequel, but it isn't. And part of that disappointment with me, I will be honest at the time was just like, well, these creatures are all good and everything, but why, why is the, the best thing in the movie, the very last shot and then nothing else happens. If I'm that expecting it. That didn't bother me at all. I, I would have been happy even, you know, like I said, I would have been happy watching it from beginning to end. I would have been, I could have even dealt with the space jockey stuff, although it wasn't necessary. You could yeah, you could have brought the engineers in, had them. It should it should have had nothing to do with a space jockey. You could have left that a complete mystery. But why just why have this script that's just it's abysmal. <laughs> it really, I think yeah. it did just get revamped too much until it was yeah. something unrecognizable. Like maybe it was too messy. There were too many questions unanswered. So he decided to remove this exposition and say, you know, this is my art. This is supposed to be left up to your interpretation. And then and then this is just how it got spit out. Yeah. I also think, as I said, I think there's a perhaps an argument to be made, and we'll never actually know for sure but that this could have also been guilty of what I've said with Covenant, which is that there is a world in which you link this directly to Alien by just having the engineer ship take off. And then you can insinuate that it's the one that crash landed on LV-426. And there you go. The movies yeah. are linked with any further explanation needed. But it feels like, again, they were just like, no, no, I want to keep on exploring this. So let's make another five movies in between instead. And <laughs> comics. And, and yeah, comics. Yeah, other else. special things in between. I mean, there's a bevy of stuff that probably isn't in any of our heads. Like they did explain what happened to um, Shaw after this, and it was yeah, but it's not weird. satisfying. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. I really resent it. They also explain in a spin-off comic what happens to the Deacon, and again, it's bizarre. If you if you're a curious audience, the Deacon apparently transformed into a mountain. And no, I'm not making that up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for fuck's oh, yeah. sake. That's, that's, that's <laughs> a bit of uh, Penny was But big. it explains why the space jockey was so big. Apparently, they don't stop growing. Well, yeah, it, was, it would have been massive anyway because the space jockey or the, the engineer was so big that it was birthed from. And even as an embryo, it was, or what the equivalent of a chest burster, I guess, it was huge. So it was always going to be massive. But the idea that it would then fuse with the land and become a living mountain is just so like, what? Who's been smoking what now? <laughs> but again, that's. Not related to they're, this movie. That's not this movie's like fault. <laughs> celestials. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Everybody's um, living in their dead carcasses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I did want to touch on, like I said, one of the things I do appreciate is the kind of the big themes that it touches on. And in regards to sort of if you're going to do this whole trying to give a sci-fi explanation for life, I do like that there are hints of faith and religion that are peppered throughout the movie. Um, so... That's why you have the scene of the fact that it's Christmas and uh, Ravel, is it, the, the guy? No, um, Yannick. Elvis character. Yannick, that's right, um, basically is, you know, decorating a Christmas tree and saying, you know, oh, you have to have holidays so that time still has meaning and stuff. But I also think that's a very deliberate allusion to Christ and Christianity and whatever else. I love that Shaw is, as I said, a person of faith. And I really do love that, although I don't know how we got to it, I love the scene of her discussing death with her father and the idea of, you know, oh, what happens afterwards? Lots of people disagree. I believe it's paradise. Why do you think that? There's no, you know, scientific basis. I don't. It's just what I choose to believe. And I like that it explores that idea. I also really, really love the fact that Holloway basically tries to, you know, poo-poo her religion and her faith by saying when they discover the engineers, well, take off your cross because now it's pointless. And she says, why? And he responds with something like, well, we know that the engineers made us. And she just simply responds, who made them? 
And I'm like, yes, yeah. I love the fact that we, we have a scientist of intelligence who can still be a person of faith without the audience having to go, oh, look how dumb they are. <laughs> but maybe that's just because I'm a person of faith who likes to think I'm kind of intelligent and I hate that argument. So, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I did appreciate that the film at least had that in there rather than doing the obvious thing, which would be like, so all religion is wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah um but yeah that kind of relates to we may as well get into it now dk the idea yeah. which thankfully didn't make it into the final film that it is still event, implied, which, uh, heavily implied well it's very heavily implied but the event that happened two thousand years ago which caused the engineers to think humanity was worth destroying instead of saving was that an engineer visited earth and was trying to, you know, guide us on the right path. And that engineer was Jesus Christ. And we crucified him. And he was crucified. And... <laughs> when that came up, I was like, <sighs> just stop, please. Just, that's it now. Put the gun yeah. down, you're drunk. <laughs> I was reading an article, I think it was Collider, where he said, you know, they didn't really pinpoint it to a specific year, so maybe they're just really pissed that we knifed Caesar in the back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I did read. know that I mean, I, I get it. And no, no, I, yeah, I like it, it was, it yeah. was, but yeah. it was definitely intended to be that. That was the, what the script had said. And like I said, I'm glad they cut it out because they skirt the line of sacrilege and offensive already. So that would have just been like, no, nope, too far. I'm this, sorry, this, but no. This, and I didn't this, take you know, it that he was an general. engineer, but that he was an emissary of the engineers. That the engineers gave him the. Um, gave him the tasked him with spreading the word of like everybody needs to behave in this manner you know this is what makes engineers happy with us basically i love that you defend things but you're bringing a lot of your own there's nothing in the movies that suggests yeah. that <laughs> that's an emissary for the engineers i hate to be the one to bring it up but, but it's, it's, no yeah. it was in the blu-ray it was in the deleted scene uh, we'll, we'll get into that i guess it's to okay. me it's yeah, again, it's another of these things that's indicative of the script as a whole. And I know we touched upon it last year with regards to that Key and Peel sketch for Gremlins 2, but that is yeah. honestly what it feels like watching this, what the script meeting must yeah. have been. And yeah. this yeah. alien like will be Jesus. Oh, great. Yeah. There's no bad ideas in here. I can't, No, I kind of get it. I get what they were going for. It's just really, to me personally, offensive. And like I said, it gets too sacrilegious at a point and it also feels like you can't have that that in completely clashes with shaw's belief so it undermines her character as well so i kind of like that it's not in there um but again well, don't, don't do that <laughs> i mean you also get into the philosophical you know questions with regards to yeah they sent an emissary down and they're just saying yeah you need to be better as a people you need to be peaceful you need to love each other no okay we'll wipe you all out with this biological weapon yeah. So this is what no. uh, the last engineer says. Um, he says, we gave you Eden. You worshipped us. You, we praised our creation from above. We watched you time and time again kill each other, start wars. We came back and saved your souls, but we left you to make your own fate. But your kind is a barbaric, violent species. We tried once more to save you. We took a mother's child back to paradise. And that's what they called their planet, paradise, and educated him. So basically, alien abduction taught him the meaning of life and creation. We put him back into Eden. So they returned, you know, the human form to Earth to educate your kind. But your kind decided to punish him. We gave you the fruits of life and you repay us by having it by leaving it to rot. Mm. See, I, I don't like that. At all. Where, I what's just, this? Is this it's, like it's a deleted going scene or something? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like the why so many people like the Da Vinci Code, just we taking, you know, biblical passages and weaving them, making them real, explaining how they could be real. And you might have a problem with with Da Vinci's code as well. But I find that very interesting and fascinating when we try to I, it's no different than what our ancestors did, trying to take the movement of the sun, the movement of the moon and make it make sense to their where reality. Was this where was this said in the movie? Have I missed a scene or something? This was Blu-ray. This was a deleted scene. Deleted scene, yeah. Can you see how offensive it is that you're using my holy scripture for your stories when we have a thousand places we can take them from? I mean, do, why? They do do it with the Iliad, the Odyssey. I mean, it's they do do it with lots of other things. 
they're classical. Yeah, but... That's classical literature. It's not a belief system as such. Exactly, yeah. The final film, at least, isn't as guilty of it because it still has Shaw being able to be a person of that faith because there are still bigger questions to ask. But like I said, I don't like the idea that you specifically tie it so so much to, to something that's meant to to be, you know, sacrosanct. You don't F about with it. You just it feels it like be. a shortcut. It feels yeah. like a shortcut instead of actual writing. And opening a can of worms that you don't need to. In my opinion. Well, they kind of cut it later when um, um, Waylon is there dying and he's like, there's nothing. And oh, David that. answers back, I know. I hate that. Just The, yeah. the movie trying to be a nihilist wet dream, trying to appeal to all the emo frigging shards of the world. I hate when anything does that. I hated when Torchwood did that. It's not cool. Oh, that it doesn't make you edgy. Abysmal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just, I don't get that. I don't get why that scene was there. I don't, I don't like it at all. But again, that's me. I'm, I'm, you know, maybe you love it. Maybe you like that idea. You don't understand how anyone can find it satisfying that the answer to, you know, is there anything more than this or life after death is just nah. How is that comforting at all? You know. Oh, yeah. Um, no, that part. But uh, I don't know. It could have just been, uh, yeah, I don't know. I could, it was, could have just been them trying to leave it vague, not not saying one way or the other exactly what yeah. it is. Because how would David know? David's not going to heaven. How would he know that there's nothing there? How how would he be able to answer? I know. Well, again, that that's open to interpretation in a thousand ways. Of like, he doesn't have a soul, so he you know, right? He's closer Dude, does to he death. Dream of or... electric sheep, right? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> so yeah. Like, which I said, it's the sort of thing that Ridley Scott touches on all the time. He's fascinated with this artificial life, and you know how close they are, and the questions of if there is an afterlife, would would robots go there? Would AI go there? You know, which Do is, all is dogs a cool thing go to, to explore, heaven? You know? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Again, it's, it's a fascinating thing to explore, but I don't find it interesting that then you give the definitive answer of, nope. I just think that's a silly, especially in a film which starts with Patrick Wilson saying, okay, I don't know for sure, but it's what I choose to believe to then have the movie at the end effectively going, well, he's an idiot. He's wrong. Yeah. It's nothing. <laughs> it just seems, yeah. It seems counterintuitive to your own plot basically as well. On a, on a movie level but anyway that's neither here nor there i just um, like that it's it's really exploring the whole the thomas aquinas his whole thing is what was the very first cause and I, that's something i've always been you know, whether you're um religious or purely scientific or or a amalgamation of both you know going back to the big bang well what caused the big bang is the universe just a, an expanding and contracting like a heartbeat what what started it and that's just really fascinating to me and actually starts to scare me when i really think about when i really think about it yeah and i, I appreciate those big questions but again even then the movie points out its own flaw itself because it even says you're also discounting three centuries of darwinism so even science is wrong so it's like well what are you doing here which you know you want to both take a side and leave it vague what is it you know um I just don't appreciate that it doesn't give answers to anything, and it just goes. And this is a bigger question for you to ponder. Like I don't, yeah, I don't, want, I don't like that in art. You know, I don't want that. I mean, it's obviously very, you know, based. It, it's Ridley Scott. It's speculative fiction with regards to that, and uh, he brings in brings questions into his movies that even the cast thinks is bullshit. Going back to Blade Runner, but yeah. he does it in a way to me that just comes across as pretentious and condescending and that's the yeah. problem I'm with it and that was the next kind of note I'd made about the writing was just like do you find it fascinating or pretentious that it all links to the myth of Prometheus you know stole fire from the gods because we you know or whatever else and then punished by the gods for wanting to know a bit more and you know eternal torment as a result and it strikes me as very pretentious personally um, but I can see how a lot of people might think oh I get the, the, the mythological what you're exploring here um, and I would imagine probably, Sandy, you fall back onto the latter category. Yeah, well, and then it also goes back to Prometheus himself and that whole mythological, you know, giving man the gift of fire, giving them answers, helping them along. And he was eternally tortured for it. 
bad things happen when you go looking and, and certainly yeah. bad things happen to them. Uh, they were punished for it, uh, for trying to look into, for trying to find God, like the real God, like many more religious people feel about trying to figure, you know, find the God particle and the whole particle accelerator that one day we're going to be punished for, you know, trying to look into God's eyes. And, and yeah. that's very interesting too. But yeah, I definitely fall into the latter categories that I just love to think about this stuff. And I appreciate this movie because it made me think about this stuff. That's fair enough. But again, it seems counterintuitive to the idea of the movie to say, don't go looking for answers, you'll be punished when that is the movie's supposed entire point. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It just seems like, what are you trying to say? Do you know what you're even trying to say? Is the ultimate the message, problem. don't look? I mean, <laughs> I think that's the problem. He doesn't know what he's trying to say. And that's yeah. why I think the script could have done with another couple of drafts before they sat down and, th and said, yeah, this is the one we're going to film. Because as it stands, none of it, in my opinion, none of it holds together. Yes, you have the big questions. On the other hand, you've got the just sheer idiocy. As you say, it's neither pro-science, it's neither pro-faith. It's Yes, it asks the big questions, but it doesn't seem interested in answering any question other than yeah they're all shit <laughs> yeah yeah i kind of yeah I, I see what you mean and um what was i i've completely forgotten what i was gonna say but i'll move on because this is gonna be a long episode because there's a lot to discuss so it makes sense um but yeah just on a pure movie level i did want to note as well that uh, maybe it's just because I've studied movies so much, but I really hated the Chekhov's medical bypass machine moment where you see yeah. it at the start of the movie and an awful lot of focus is put on it because as anybody with any kind of savvy movie, you know, literacy, you just know that's going to become important later. And it's just like, we didn't need you to do that. We could have seen it in the background and, you know, made our own conclusions. <laughs> it seems a bit like handholding, especially for a film like this, which doesn't give you anything half the time. Um, yeah. but I did appreciate that... Again, before we know Wayland's alive, there are those nice little hints like David talking to somebody and what did he say from Vickers. And I loved that the furthering that kind of mystery was the idea that the pod was purely set for a male. And I was like, ah, oh, of course, because Wayland, because why else would it be set to a male when it's in Vickers' um, escape pod quarters or whatever? So that kind of feeds into that mystery as well as the idea that maybe she's a robot, so she wouldn't need it. Um, anyway, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. I just thought it was interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. On a script level, I like the idea of them. Again, I've said this before, but I always appreciate when a movie gives you a ticking clock. So the idea of like the deadly storm to get them back to the ship made a lot more sense than just, oh, we're scared, let's run back. Yeah. Uh, and the visuals for that when the cloud was uh, following them. But yeah. why <laughs> wouldn't you be holding on to the dang alien head knowing you're in a rough terrain, <laughs> four wheel thing? I mean, why wouldn't you at least have a grip on that thing or have secured it somehow? See, now we're getting to even Shaw. Even Shaw's affected by the stupidity. Oh, everybody is. But it, I mean, this isn't the only film where that is the case with a lot of the characters. And I'm not even just talking about Covenant. <laughs> you know, lots of movies have dumb characters. But in a film which purports to be so highbrow and, like I said, occasionally pretentious, it just brings, it, it kind of reinforces that it's not. It's just people that have read far too much supposedly pseudo intellectual stuff and thrown all their ideas in a way that makes no sense yeah. to me anyway you know it, it um, does come across like uh i'd say a university student or, or even a college student's attempt at speculative fiction yes there's yeah. some big ideas behind it but they don't quite know how to ask them if that makes sense or how That's to not mean, answer yeah. them how to not answer them yeah yeah or how to just make it logical and coherent in a way. Like I said, that it's like it's like when you give somebody an essay to write at university about a subject and they know all of the bits and pieces you're supposed to include, but don't put them together in any way that makes sense. No. And it's like, okay, I get that you did the reading, but this is nonsense. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I, I do uh, like that line as well when um, he says, you know, oh, I've got a message for your scientists. Tell them to go themselves with a little bit of static interrupting the curse and everything. I don't know why I found that amusing. That's because I was just looking for anything with a bit of levity at that point. Well, that was the other thing in terms of, like I said, related to the idea that the xenomorphs don't exist yet. One of the engineers is specifically seen with their chest having been burst open from the inside. So, yeah. again, you're contradicting yourself. And like you said, the writing on the wall literally has... Yeah. Exactly. Um, 
<laughs> Isn't it weird how they mm -hmm. almost seem to the aliens? I mean, the um, engineers do kind of seem to have a, a reverence for that life form. And what if they're doing essentially what David did? They're just they're just propagating the alien life form throughout the universe. It has nothing to do with human origins at all. There is a, a school of thought and a lot of the sort of fandom and stuff that are, that do believe that. And like I said, that, that then try to rectify covenant with David is trying to copy this design that they perfected already. Um, because the biological weapon wasn't the black goo with the dumb name. It is the actual xenomorph or the actual eggs. Like a lot of the, um, behind the scenes stuff from the first alien when they were asked about what the ship was on LV426. I think Ridley Scott at one point said it's a bomber. The alien eggs are being used like bombs where you just drop them on the surface of a planet and let the xenomorphs take over and that's it. Yeah. And again, that's that's fine. So why do you need to explore this idea of a, di a different pathogen that then does the same thing? It just feels, again, you've convoluted your own idea too much. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to just be shedding on it because I do like bits and pieces. The bigger themes, they do use words like Godforsaken and Vickers espousing the idea of a natural order and the idea that it is her literal father that's leading the mission. Um, you know, perhaps a link to God, the father. Um, again, big ideas, no no real reason for them, <laughs> doesn't link it anyway, but cool. Um, Except for the resentment yeah. between her and David, which um, yeah, once you watch that. a film and you go back and rewatch and you see you know, when he says, this is my, my only son. So proud of, of him. No, he and, says, and, this is my greatest creation. And she, immediately, yes, that's oh, it. Fuck you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I got that. I got that. There was that inferiority complex and that David is like the, his superior favorite child, even though he was artificially created as opposed to being born in the way that she was. I thought um, how they delivered that news, that was actually annoying because it was just like, yeah. she just says father. <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> like that was very, teenager. that was very Mexican soap opera slash Star Wars. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I appreciate the the, the, the fact that you said that because I, I said the same. Um, I don't, I hate this because I just don't get it. This idea of David saying, doesn't everyone want their parents dead? And Joel responding, well, I didn't. Because where does that come from? Yeah, I've never known anybody. anybody. Yeah, exactly. It's never come up in any fiction I've read. It's yeah. It's, and it's I mean, in, it's in Greek mythology a lot, and Shakespeare. <laughs> okay, again, we're being charitable. And if I was going to be similarly charitable, I can say maybe it's a mistranslation of what they were trying to say, which is, doesn't everybody hope to outlive their parents? Which I could agree with, but nobody I know is like, I want my parents dead. That's so stupid. Yeah. No, definitely, definitely not on my part. <laughs> yeah. It's very weird. Um, again, in terms of, as I've mentioned already, like not being suspicious enough of David, when he's mentioning like, Dada Murray, that's not airborne. How do you know? Again, that's immediate red flag, take him back to the ship, turn him off moment, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I think, as I said, to answer one of your previous questions, I think it's Yannick who decides they were heading to Earth. It's the ship that we know from or the ship design that we know as the juggernaut from Alien, and it must be to destroy. Uh, I've answered one of my previous questions in my notes, so I do apologize because I clearly didn't pay enough attention. Um, but when I'm talking about like the potential nihilism of there's nothing and why is it there? Apparently, according to my notes, there is a line that says that when David says, I know, but it's a good journey, which I guess is the answer. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> I clearly need to pay more attention. So, yeah. um, apologies to anybody that was screaming that like 20 minutes ago when I was saying that, because that is the answer that if you do happen to believe that, then you might believe that life's a journey that's worth living anyway. So, all right, I get you. Fair enough. Uh, I do think they slightly underplayed the idea of the, the self-sacrifice, even though I love that scene when the um, Chance, Ravel and Yannick basically decide they're going to ram the juggernaut to stop it from getting to Earth. I thought they could have made a bit more of that, perhaps. But again, that might be just me. <laughs> uh, and again, I love that it plays into these themes that they've kind of talked about this ongoing bet. And as they're about to basically crash and die, he says, oh, don't think this lets us off. And he responds with, you can pay me on the other side. Which mm -hmm. I was like, ah, we're still talking about, you know, afterlives and paradises <laughs> and whatever else. So I did I like how they touched upon her faith in the, in the closing narration where she says it's the year of our Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although I hate the fact that well. used that closing narration. I hate it. The Ripley one, yeah. Yeah. 
I don't mind it. I can I can forgive it. Last survivor of the Prometheus. Yeah, it it just seems copy paste. Mm. But having said that, I find that way less egregious than what follows, which I've just put. Enjoy the Deacon design. You'll never see it again. It's just more alien teasing pointlessness. There's a good atmospheric scene of its birth, but it should have significance because it's the last shot of the film. And in actual fact, it's just a really cool creature design that's wasted. <laughs> well, it does go Am on I to the wrong? Of the mountain, apparently. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't look anything like it. It's a mountain at that point, you know? <laughs> But yeah, I mean, am I wrong? It just feels like they're trying to pretend it's got significance because of the dramatic music and the fact that it's the last shot and it's just like, and? <laughs> you know? It, it, again, it contradicts Ridley Scott's statement of there's nothing xenomorph-like in this movie because it feels like the movie ending in a way that's like, aha, look, it's something that might be related in some way to the alien. <laughs> I think it was basically, you know, you've sat through this, here, I'll give you something. And it mm -hmm. just came. Yeah, possibly. It, it okay. just felt a bit like one of those DC post credit screens that just doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> so all post credits at this point in life, then. Um, yeah. Yeah. I also this is a, it's potentially such a nitpick, so apologies, but it did just bug me that Shaw gets the trilobite taken out of her that she's been impregnated with by Holloway because it's identified it as a foreign body type thing, and it cuts it out and it, you know holds it in place. And I'm like, this medical equipment that has identified this thing doesn't have the ability to kill it it just wants to leave it there to grow to massive size for the next and we're talking over like probably days here before when they go back and it's grown and can grab the engineer conveniently yeah it bugged me it just didn't sit right in that way like nobody's entered that room the thing doesn't kill it it's just there growing and growing until it conveniently becomes useful again mm. anyway <laughs> And again, it's clearly just supposed to evoke a face hugger to me, at least. Yeah. And yeah, if don't do that if you're not going to do <laughs> claim you're linked to Alien. Um, but yeah, I have some notes on the direction because I kind of tried to make them, as I said at the time we were going to, uh, you know, first review this. Um, I will say I think the opening is very pretentious. The idea of like the landscapes and the epic music and that kind of ties into the it's wanting to be a big question of the creation of life and stuff. But yeah, it, it wasn't a, a it was a very inauspicious start for me. Um, what, one thing I do like, little bits and pieces, but I love the way that the movie reveals Numi Rapace through a breaking of a wall through the other side. It's a very random directing note that only a proper film geek would notice, but I was like, ah, oh, that's a way, cool way to introduce a character because you wouldn't necessarily think we're going to have a break through a wall and the camera's on the side that's not where she is. <laughs> um, so that's cool. I also think there's a lot of good like framing and staging and it looks really impressive. And I can't remember if it was you, Sandra, or if it was Adrienne that says that the, the visual effects for the holographic controls and the futuristic stuff is all really good. Um, Must have been Adrienne, yeah. yeah. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. Um, yeah, uh, little things as well. Like, um, to me, it seems like it's a hint of what's coming when Holloway kind of merges with the engineer hologram at one point because they're, I think it's replaying them running away or something. Um, and it specifically is him that merges with it and it's him that gets infected. So it's like, oh, maybe that's a, a clue or something. Um, I think the scene, although it is dumb when they're basically taunted, I think the actual scene of the Hammerpede attack is good in terms of it's a well sort of staged creature attack. Again, would could have done without it having acidic blood because it seems like it's just there to be a link that you may or may not want. But yeah, the scene itself is good. And um, But I will say it's kind of, to me, it's, it's reminiscent of another problem, which is that the film is halfway through and stuff has only just started to happen, which to me, yes, I know that it's asking a lot of big questions and wants to be in intelligent, but you kind of have to have something occur. So it's very boring for the first half of the movie to me as well. Oh, it's, it's not for me. I Okay, fair enough. When, on, on, I'm not trying to be contrary. It's, I think for, no, the, first, for the first 30 minutes, apart from the, the dream watching sequence, I think it's a beautiful. I, I was sat there in the okay. cinema, and what the section where they're landing and they're seeing the valley and the structure, it was giving me goosebumps. I thought, oh, this is this is just the best, and it just mm. that's the problem I have with it. It, it for, up until about halfway through, it was great, and then it just fell apart with this increasing number of insane decisions to me. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Um... But yeah, related to what you were saying with that, like I said, I do like, there's some really great imagery, but it's kind of daft. It's very style over substance. So the idea that the whole cliff is a skull, for example, is a really cool visual and looks amazing. 
but doesn't really bear much scrutiny. <laughs> no. Yeah. Again, you've already touched on this, but I didn't really appreciate the explanation that the space jockey was just a helmet, because to me it took away a lot of that mystery and that coolness behind what looked very alien with its weird trunk and everything. Yeah. yeah. There was no need to touch upon that at all, I don't think. No, not at all. Not at all. Um, again, another thing that I noticed is when the trilobite was first removed and it's curled up, it's very much like the, the xenomorph as well, which again is a visual that, yeah, seems contradictory. Yeah, the scene where um, the blood's running down and dripping off it, it was very, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's basically the symbol, the, the promotional thing they used for Alien 3, where the xenomorph is like curled up in a circle in the same way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, let's see. I liked the five field attack scene. I thought it was well directed. What, whichever month they decided to go with, and I mentioned already, I kind of liked the um, you know, character tension in Holloway's attack as well. Um, and I think that's about it. Oh, and except that at the ending, yes, I get the point that it specifically shows the ship they're on rising to heaven because they're heading into paradise. Yes, themes. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah. So any, any other thoughts on direction? Sandra, I'm aware that you're, you're not talking very much. Have we upset you? No, 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 not at all. Not at all. I just okay, feel cool, cool, cool. like really just rehashing what we've hashed. <laughs> okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, that's fine then, yeah. So any anything from you, DK, other than just no? <laughs> no, no I've, I've, I mean, I've said what I said. I, I do think it's visually, it's a, an interesting interesting movie, and it looks, it looks great to me. Yeah. Oh, I think it looks amazing. That's one of the things I will say for it is, that, like I said, um, I've already mentioned, but the next section would have been VFX, and I, I've said already, you know, the holograms, the spaceship scenes, fantastic. It's, it's a very, it's very well done in that respect as well. I also think the scene, one scene which could have been terrible but isn't, is when David is decapitated but still talking, and I think that looks flawless with an effect that it, it's got to be quite hard to do, <laughs> you know. Um, so I appreciated that as well. As much as I don't like them being there, I also like that they kind of semi faithfully recreated the space jockey look. Or what was ultimately revealed to be their life suit thing. Um, so it was still nice to see it, even if I'd rather it wasn't there. Uh, and just as a final bit of criticism, we've already touched on it, but yeah, the old age prosthetic makeup is awful. It's very, awful. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's very Crypt Keeper or... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely zero expression in the man's face. Nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it just seems, like I get the point was that they said they, they were going to cast an older actor, I think they'd approached Max von Sydow at one point. Um, but when they cast Guy Pearce, they realized they could use him as the young and old Wayland. And I'm just thinking, it's such a waste of time because you could have just cut the scene with the video at the start. Yeah. Or just, you know, just cast an older actor and then don't have that. Have somebody plus, else giving that exposition. <laughs> he doesn't even look 80 or 90. He looks yeah. 700. Like, it's yeah, just exactly. so much yeah. wrinkles. Yeah, I know, <laughs> to the point that it's like he's got barely any hair and what is there is, like I said, full-on Crypt Keeper slick back, uh, you know, I'm decomposing in my own body kind of stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a shame. But that's the only thing that I think that they got wrong in terms of the visuals. Uh, do you have DK? You've touched on this a little bit, so I'm intrigued if you have anything more. Do you have anything on the music or sound? Uh, I did like. Uh, you know, it, it's probably a bit hypocritical. I I did. There's nothing really that stands out uh, other than the Jerry Goldsmith alien cues, which is used in that little section. Which, well, it's... <laughs> excuse me. I wanted to um, I wanted to bring that up because I'm not sure if I'm mishearing this but to me i heard hints of that alien score when they discover the engineer ship and they first kind of go into it and david starts yes. exploring it yes that wasn't just me then <laughs> no no but when, but okay. this is the problem i mean yes it's it's all well and good in creating an unsettling atmosphere but it's not really that noticeable and when you're only the only you know cues in a score that are noticeable are the ones that's reused and cribbed from another composer. Yeah. Especially something that you're supposedly not tying the, the movie to. It's, it's, yeah. it's not great. Yeah. And I will say I that mean, I was, said, Don't get me wrong. It wasn't bad. It was perfectly adequate. Yeah. Um, Which but, just wasn't notable, as you're saying. No. And like I said, the thing that I've noticed is that I think it's a lot more effective when it's minimalist and there's little or no music whatsoever. Like that is way more atmospheric and it plays more like a sort of horror movie in those scenes not not you know gory that but that kind of thoughtful 
I guess, elevated horror, for want of a better word, to call back to our Scream review. Um, and that's those were the scenes where I was like, oh, I, I'm listening for music so that I can make notes, and there actually isn't any, and it's working. It's It adds because you can just hear ambient sound and the slightest little click on the deck or whatever else I think really helps to amp up that tension or make it feel like you're in this isolated, lonely spaceship in the middle of space in a way. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate that. Uh and I, oh, other than that, I just thought, like I said, in terms of the original score, it's guilty of the thing that I absolutely hate, which is whenever there's a dramatic moment, it feels the need to just signpost it by going really bombastic. And I'm like, yo, I know that the dude who's discovered he's infected by alien goo is dramatic. I don't need you then going, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> like, full on, like, I get it. You know? <laughs> but uh, yeah. So any other thoughts then on that before we, uh, we move on? No, music didn't no. stand out a whole lot to me. Fair enough. Uh, what I'll do then, I'll, I'll touch on our favourite character moment and line, and then from there go into the audience response and then give our conclusion. And hopefully that will uh, keep the episode from being too long. But I do like that we had the discussion and we seem to have three, not opposing in an argumentative way, but three different viewpoints to bring to the film. So hopefully it's made for interesting listening as well. Uh, so we'll start with uh, you since you're the guest, Sandra, and ask who was your favourite character in the movie? My favorite character was actually David because I just felt like he was the most complex. He was definitely unreliable, uh, kind of like an unchained AI even. It seems like he was problem. His creation, the way he was, was problematic because we find out in Covenant later they, you know, made some, put some more constraints on their, on their um, Sims and um, I felt like his very first motivation was to save Waylon. Uh, but then when mm -hmm. Waylon dies, he's he's searching for motivation and he just falls back on that obsession he has with being human, but also kind of feeling superior to humans. Um, I just thought yeah. that just makes him very complex and um, that made him my favorite. Very, very how. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um what about you, DK? Your favorite character in the movie? God, uh, I'm gonna have to go with Yannick. Okay, I can understand that. He seems that. to be the only one there with an ounce of common sense. <laughs> His noble sacrifice is really good. To be fair, I will give you that, so I can kind of see why you would say that for definite. Um, my favorite character is Shaw. I would surprise. I was surprised we didn't kind of agree more on that because I think Numi does the best acting job. I think the character has some actual depth and an interesting journey through the movie. I've already mentioned I love that she kind of has faith and she kind of sticks to that. And yeah, um, I, I just think that is the most interesting person to follow. Uh, Sandra, what was your favorite moment in the film Prometheus? <laughs> I, it actually featured Shaw. I um, liked when she was trying to excise the alien from her abdomen. Um, just that she was coming across these obstacles and just knocking them down one by one. Okay, how am I going to do this? Okay, I'm going to do it this way. And it just really showed her smarts and why, you know, why she is on this journey as opposed to the other people. Why why she was picked for this crew. Why she was yes. the one who put everything together. I just, that was her Ripley moment besides the fact that she was, you know, down to her skivvies. Um, yeah. Uh, just, she was just really strong in that moment. I saw her as a very strong female character, but I just thought it was really cool how she was um, just knocking down obstacles and figuring things out and, and, and getting that thing out of her. <laughs> that was certainly yeah. nothing else I'm, she wanted yeah. more. But um, having said that, I uh, going back to what you mentioned earlier about the, I think my some of my favorite actual scenes though in the movie were those wide expansive shots of the planet, um, especially as they're running away from the silica storm. And then in, in the background, you see the ringed planet. I love those planet scapes. It actually reminded me, especially when they were, uh, going across in their little doom buggies, it reminded me so much of the video game Mass Effect, which I loved. <laughs> I just felt like I was in the Meku just running across a planet. Uh, I really did like <laughs> that. But as far as, you know, characters, uh, scenes that a character were in, um, definitely that scene. PK, what was your favorite moment in the movie? Uh, like Sandy, I've got to call out the uh, embryo removal scene where okay. she's getting the trailer bike taken out, but it's not my favourite. My favourite, again, like I mentioned earlier, it's when they're landing 
and you can see the the valley through the the ship screen and the, mm -hmm. the structure as i say it gave me goosebumps i love that i okay. bet seeing that in the Fair theater enough. was extra awesome i did not see this in the theater. it was I, I watched it i saw it on uh, imax and it was oh stunning. my gosh yeah that's fair enough i didn't see it in cinemas either um i did see covenant in the cinema but yeah <laughs> anyway weirdly enough um, for a film i hated this much i saw it four times <laughs> why it was those, i want to make sure those, i hate it <laughs> it was one of those situations where i went to watch it on my own started loving it hated it and then a friend wanted to go and then another friend and then ended up going on a date and we went to the cinema and she picked that and I was just like, I can't say no. So, yeah, I ended up watching it four times. <laughs> and it's never called her it... again. <laughs> <laughs> no, he got laid by asking her if she was a robot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, learned something. <laughs> she had to um, prove it to weird. Yeah, It's weird that you've kind of grown so bitter towards the movie because I think each time I watch it I actually appreciate it a little bit more I mean I wouldn't go crazy or anything but when I first watched it I was like irredeemable trash and yeah every time I've watched it since I'm kind of like do you know what I can get something from it and I, I don't regret that I own it you know? things. I don't yeah. get me wrong I when I watched it this time I wasn't going to and like I said but I I thought oh, God, I've, I've written so much about it I'm intrigued is there anything that I'm missing so I went back to watch it it did improve, but the only reason it improves is because I'm stealing myself for the idiocy and ignoring the parts <laughs> that I hate. Other than that, it's fine. DK, for the man who is the actual parent of the D MST3K, repeat to yourself, it's just a sure relax. You are very hung up on this idiocy. I, I to say. Oh, yeah. Oh, come on. It's, it's, a, it's a, oh, I'm not going to go in. I've said everything I'm going to say, but if you're going to bring a film out like that, don't have idiots on the ship. Yeah. It's just weird because it you would not normally strike me as the kind of person that would, I guess, hand wave it away more or be more forgiving. I, I, normally I would if it was one person, if it was two people, but it's practically yeah. everyone. Fair and I, I can't handle, I mean, you know, and you know yourself, I love some garbage films, absolute garbage, <laughs> but they know, but they know they're garbage. And I think that's yeah. the problem I have with Prometheus. It tries to pretend it's more than it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see that. I see that point for sure. Um, yeah, my favourite moment, I've got to be honest, there's nothing that wowed me in terms of a specific moment, which isn't to say that I thought anything was bad, and there were certainly moments that I thought were good or enjoyable, but it was a struggle to think of anything that stood out specifically for me. And in the end, what I went with was the scene of the sacrifice of, of Yannick, Ravel, and Chance, because... To me, it's visually it looks amazing, which is cool on that kind of surface level, you know, them ramming the juggernaut ship. Um, but also it's the most human moment in the movie that they're kind of like, we, we're going to, you know, sacrifice ourselves for the whole of Earth. And even, I even love that line of, you know, are you guys, if you if you want to get off, do it now. Well, with respect, you're a ship pilot and you're going to need help. It's kind of mm -hmm. like, I, I love that. I love that moment mm -hmm. between them. And yeah, I just, it's, it's a rare touch of, like I said, in, in this sterile kind of, movie that wants to give all the answers and stuff it's a nice moment of maybe we'll be all right after all because at the end of the day we have at least a shared humanity and a kind of love for life you know that we are, are willing to protect yeah yeah and all that that intentional because as I, I think it is i think it is saying that all these experts were arrogant yeah i think it is i think it's there on a very deliberate reason and i think yeah that is the point is that's related perhaps to the idea that well life's about the journey is that maybe god's in all of us and it's, it's the way of the film acknowledging that as in part as well this belief of all we need is each other if we are at least open and loving and honorable and all these other nice things and you know humans can be you know worthy as well um so yeah i appreciated that that was my favorite scene uh so anyway uh, moving on sandra what was your favorite line in the movie my favorite line is uh, when Charlie tells her, you know, I, I guess you can take your father's cross off. And she's like, why would I want to do that? And he's yeah. just very flippant and he is kind of condescending and pretentious himself because they made us, you know, that's it without even considering that there's more to consider here, that there's another question opened as opposed to now we have all the answers she says, yeah. and who made them? And then that's just yeah. what I had brought up other, uh, earlier. You know, this goes back, you know, ad infinitum 
you know, who made them, who made them, who made them. And that's yeah. just really intriguing to me. Yeah, I, I kind of already mentioned, it's not what I've picked for mine, but I, I had similar thoughts. I like the idea that, like I said, uh, you can ask those questions or you can still have that faith, even with scientific evidence without coming across as, as dumb. Because I don't think Shaw ever is. I think she's an intelligent, capable woman who just happens to be a woman of faith. Um, and yeah, the idea that science and religion are mutually exclusive has never sat right with me. So I appreciate that the movie didn't take that stance, as you said. It kind of mocked right, it with Hollywood. very like, much so, you know. yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> DK, what was your favourite line in the movie? It was the uh, the little exchange between David and Holloway. Uh, I think Sandy touched upon it earlier, uh, where it says, uh, why do you think your people made me? We made you because we could. Can you imagine how disappointing it would be for you to hear the same thing from your creator? Mm. Yeah, that is another good one, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I can't disagree. I, it, these are things I could, probably could and should have picked, but didn't. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway. Uh, so, yeah, my favourite line in the movie, again, I've kind of touched on the reasons behind it and stuff, but it's it's uh, similar to yours, Sandra, and it's at the very end when she makes a point of getting her cross and David just says, even after all this, you still believe. And I'm like, See, I love that. I love that that's there because, it again, it continues the depth of that character. And even though she kind of wants the answers of, well, why do you hate us and stuff, it doesn't take away from her faith and it doesn't stop her... And like I said, it, that's far too often in these things you see, like, I've been through a harrowing ordeal, so I don't believe in God anymore. And it's very nice to see, you know, a film that doesn't fall into that cliche. Because <laughs> it would have been, again, very easy to have her just throw it away. It's like, well, this is pointless. I don't believe anymore. And I, I like they didn't, they didn't do that. And for some <laughs> characters, they felt like they had their answers. And other characters, it just made more questions. And that was interesting. Yeah, precisely. Uh, awesome. So what I will do then, we will move to the uh, audience response section of the podcast. And if I can find it, uh, the first bit of response that I have is from Discord. Uh, we had a couple of responses on there. I don't need to read out um, Sandra's because you've been on the episode. So I assume <laughs> that you've already said what you wanted to. Um, it's so, my conclusion, okay. actually. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Fair enough. Um, so yeah, uh, Adrienne did watch Prometheus. She wasn't going to, but she did in the end and just says, uh, regarding Prometheus, it was better than the lawnmower man. Um, <laughs> you know, does it, did it make Creed look better by comparison? And she said, Creed is basically Shakespeare right now. <laughs> I, <laughs> I responded, now you've got to watch Alien Covenant and confirm to Sandra that it is in fact the superior movie. Which <laughs> responded with a gift just saying the bar is super low. <laughs> Um, and then Adrienne just cl uh, clarified to conclude, at least I know the story now. I didn't hear it, but I won't watch it again unless it's under duress. <laughs> so. It occurred to me halfway through the podcast that that parallel may have been purposeful. Another uh, AI with a God complex, La Man. Oh, okay. Got you. That halfway makes... through the podcast. <laughs> I just I just figured it out like 20 minutes ago. So astute that, Adrienne. <laughs> She is, you know. Actually, None of us got it. None of us got it. <laughs> I didn't at all. I'm really glad you said that, actually. That makes a lot of sense now. Ah, thank you again, Adrienne, for, for watching and for giving us that feedback. Um, we also have feedback from Christian's hobby blog. Christian says, Michael Fassbender is great in it, but there's not much else that the movie does for me that Alien hadn't already done. And then the emoji of the man going, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lady Vianne simply responded, I hated it. Succinct. Mm -hmm the point i guess <laughs> i don't really know what else to say to that um so the rest of the feedback that i have is all from my friends on letterboxd uh, so from my friends list robert uh, just robert says uh, the movie is four and a half stars and i think this is a borderline masterpiece i love this film uh, alex marzonia gave it three stars and just says thrilling okay uh, marianne gave it two stars and says best comedy <laughs> which i think <laughs> 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 Um, Super Barty Brothers, what a name, gives it five stars and says, a sci-fi epic that offers great scares and explores the themes of creation, religion, and motherhood. Sign me the fuck up. This would be considered a classic of the genre if nobody knew it was an alien prequel. We judged it unfairly because of all the hype surrounding it. My own reaction to it has changed over the years. I was lukewarm on it at release, but looking at the last decade of sci-fi movies, we really took Prometheus for granted. I appreciate it more now that I am removed from the hype of Ridley returning to the franchise and that all-time great movie trailer. It's not a perfect movie, but it's much better than the reputation it has. Not a perfect movie. Why did you give it five it, out of five? It, 
it really isn't it really isn't yeah <laughs> and it's not anything to do i f fundamentally disagree with that idea that like if it wasn't connected to alien it wouldn't be better people would still be idiots <laughs> anyway, but, uh, that was the audience response anyway so we're going to move on and give our conclusion and score apologies for the super long episode that this will be but it'll make up for some of our shorter ones in the previous uh iterations that we've done in the, the last few weeks uh sandra again as the guest we'll come to you first you have your conclusion and a score out of five stars Okay. Uh, Prometheus overall is a movie I enjoyed, though there are aspects of it that likely keep it off of most people's top 10 lists. The good. Artful direction and cinematography match the energy of the movie, the story, and the actors. Numi Rapace is a great parallel to Aliens Ripley. Idris Elba, Michael Fassbender, Charlie Theron, and Kate Dickey make this a fun cast to watch. And I don't know why I left out Wong. Um, I would say Guy Pierce as well, but he was barely in it. At least his face, you know, was barely in it, which I think <laughs> actors, many of them act with their face. Um, Alien induced body horror is consistent with the franchise and a fun way to drive the plot and deliver information in these movies. What's not a fun way to drive the plot is watching a character act uncharacteristically dumb and careless to drive the plot forward. And that brings me to the bad. If you have to make your scientists careless and asinine to drive the plot forward, I maintain you're not done writing it and you should sit back down and keep at it. Or at least give us a reason like they're inebriated or they're losing their motivation and not caring anymore. They're having like, you know, a nihilistic moment, a crisis of faith. Um, but they're like kids trying to run from the yard straight into traffic. Stop and think for a minute. <laughs> That's just what I just wanted to tell them so many times. And how yeah. about don't taunt the cute alien plant, maybe? Uh, Damon Lindelof is totally fine leaving dangling plots and using unexplainable technology, which is okay usually and what we've come to expect from him. But it's really annoying in a prequel slash origin story. Now we have a big old question mark sandwich. And that's really where they've left us. They've posed questions. You know, we have the alien franchise. It didn't ask any questions about the origin at all it, it just was never even brought up i i never wondered and then they just yeah. brought this like here we're going to give you answers and then absolutely don't do that at all um mm -hmm. speaking of sandwiches i'm going to sandwich the bad stuff in between the good stuff and leave off with something positive the story was really unique and thought-provoking which for me is rare i really like that the title and ship um, it harkens back to Prometheus and how that is analogous to what happens when we go searching for answers to questions that perhaps should remain a mystery. Aliens movies never ask, how did these aliens get here? But rather, how can I survive them? So while it's a departure from the franchise in that respect, I appreciated the recipe for primordial ooze being shown in the first scenes of the movie. Overall fun uh, addition to the Aliens franchise. Okay, or oh. AKA and movie little bit bad, movie mostly good. I'm <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, for yeah. me, um, uh, my feelings on what an average movie is is a three. That's what I gave it. I felt, uh, you know, in the okay. grand scheme of things, it was average because of the little bit bad, uh, mostly good. Three is my my star. That's fine. I would even say it's justifiable if you thought it was above average, you know, slightly, which a three would be perfectly acceptable a three and, yeah yeah you do think it's more good than bad which so yeah three five makes perfect sense to me um awesome cool uh, what about you then dk dare i ask <laughs> <sighs> imagine it's christmas morning you're at the scott household ridley smiles and hands you this gift it's beautifully wrapped in the most alluring paper you've ever seen and finished off with a bow so exquisite you can only imagine the effort it took to dress it up it feels so special in fact you're afraid to open it but open it you do, tearing at the paper, tentatively at first, they're more frenzied. It's only as you tear off the last sheet covering the package that you notice a dark patch at the base of the box you've just unwrapped, a strange odour. It makes you wary, but you proceed to tear open the box and look inside. And just as you're about to peek in, in there, the bottom falls out, dropping its contents to the floor with a wet thud, and you discover the gift is simply a pile of decomposing animal intestines. <laughs> Right. I thought you were going to go a different way with that. But no. that <laughs> what can I say that I haven't already? I don't out and out hate this, but it comes pretty close. It's a good looking movie. It's got some beautiful cinematography. The effects for the most part, uh, Guy Pearce notwithstanding, are well done. 
I've got no complaints regarding the sound design or the score, but they're all layered over a script so piss poor it almost feels like some sort of personal slight to whoever is watching. It's so egregious that I can't just hold the script writer as responsible, but Scott himself. No one on earth could be that myopic. The first 30 minutes, with one or two exceptions, are everything you want from a movie like this. Intriguing, tense, beautiful to look at. I literally had goosebumps during the landing scenes, and then it turns into a sci-fi version of Dinner with Schmucks. It's so bad, it doesn't just seem content to present you with a bad movie, but goes out of its way to take a massive dump on what came before. It hand waves away long-standing questions and replaces them with all new ones that you really couldn't care less about. And even then, it doesn't appear to know how to even ask them with any sense of competence. It has no idea if it wants to be a standalone movie or part of a franchise, but either way, it shits the bed. Just, just no. And I've given it one and a half. Oh, yes, Ooh. your disappointment is palpable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Side That's note, I am that myopic without my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I think we've all felt like that at times. Um, also, my apologies for the long conclusions because mine's also long this week. But um, yeah, I just said it's a film that starts out slow and ponderous, then descends into virtual farce. It so desperately wants to be deep and relevant, but just comes off like writers and a filmmaker trying to fake it. The movie wants credit for simply acknowledging huge questions, but makes no attempt to answer them in any way or provide any meaningful exploration. It's also a film with an identity crisis that both wants to distance itself from the Alien franchise, yet use it to grab attention and exploit it to make newer and less successful ideas seem better by association. There's some good stuff here, though. It's often visually stunning, and Scott is clearly a talented director with an eye for great staging and mise-en-scene. The new creature designs are mostly pretty good, albeit too fleeting to make that much of an impact. The cast are great, though the performances are occasionally a bit too restrained for my taste. Some of the additions to the alien mythology, life cycle, and biology are intriguing, but that makes it all the more frustrating that it all gets extremely convoluted, confused, and ultimately even contradicted. The overriding feeling I get after watching this is that it's still a film that shouldn't exist. I never needed an answer to what the space jockey was. I don't need the co-creator of Lost trying to be Eric Danish or Arthur C. Clarke. And Ridley Scott has made far better movies exploring creature horror or humanity through the lens of artificial intelligence. The film does its best, but devoid of the B-movie charm of Alien or its lived-in feel, this just feels hollow, lacking spark, and wanting to be better by just believing that it is, ending with more mysteries than it began with. Not the worst thing ever, and captivating if you really focus, but still a chore due to poor pacing, length, and flimsy, rather boringly handled core plot. And I gave it two out of five, for I do think it's a little below average for me. But again, that's more than I probably would have given it at first. So, yeah. Um, awesome. So then all that remains is to combine those scores, divide them by three to give us an average for the podcast. And so the overall score then for Prometheus from the Silver Screen Podcast is... 2.16 out of 5. Who dear. <laughs> Not our best score. Probably one of our worst, unfortunately. But uh, fair, unfair. What What think you? By all means, get in touch and let us know. Not least because we always need more responses from the audience to know you're paying attention. And uh, hey, if you want to defend Prometheus, like I said, I really am enjoying listening to the people that are able to give defenses or reasons why they liked it. So I'm happy to hear it. And uh, yeah. Stay tuned. Uh, we will be back. We're doing episodes every two weeks during this third series. And our next episode will be a very special episode, a top 10 episode, I believe. Uh, DK, is that, am I right about that? <laughs> you are. You are. Check. It's the, am I allowed to tell them? Yeah, of course. We already have. Yeah. We're, oh, all right. Fair enough. Uh, we're joined by a couple of guests and we're going through our top 10 Bond movies. Yes, indeed. Including... Sandra, again, <laughs> according to my notes. <laughs> Got to start doing my homework. Uh, you can contact us anytime via all of our links that are in the descriptions uh, to our social medias and things. Again, do, do get on to us. We do like to have some interaction with the fans. DK, do you have anywhere specifically you want to shout out? No, it's just here now. I just hang out here and this things. <laughs> <laughs> no, saying, you're normally nobody, nobody contact me. I don't want to be contacted. No, I'm just kidding. I just, <laughs> I just not anywhere. <laughs> That's we're becoming a of misanthropes. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> you can contact us via Mike. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. A, lot, a lot of my social links are there and you can contact me. And if you want to join our Discord, which again, I thoroughly recommend, it's a great time and we're all in there, for example. So do get in touch with me if you want to, uh, you know, receive an invite to there. We're always very welcoming uh, and it's very good for geeks, film nerds, Star Trek and Star Wars fans. Everyone basically, um, you know, other than, yeah, <laughs> cooking we have now as well. Absolutely, we have channels for everything, so everyone's welcome, except maybe the odd right wing lunatic. So, mm -mm, you know, none don't, of that. don't apply no, if that's you. No, no. <laughs> don't even attempt that <laughs> precisely. So, no, again, I think this was a really great episode. Um, you know, it's justified its length, but sorry if you had to break it into a couple of listens or something. And uh, yeah, thanks again to Sandra for joining us, to DK for assisting me in hosting this, uh, this little venture and uh, remember in the epic words of arnie we'll be back i'll be back you have been listening to the silver screen podcast hosted by michael wilson and dk created produced and edited by michael wilson behind the scenes sections and additional material produced by dk Music by Timeless Journey. More information can be found at soundcloud.com forward slash timeless journey. Follow the podcast on Instagram at Silver Screen Podcast or look for the Silver Screen Podcast under Facebook groups. Links to all our social media accounts and more are in this episode's description. This podcast is available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Just look for Silver Screen. Hit or miss Star Trek. This has been a Mike's Podcast Production. Copyright 2022. Thank you for listening.